Welcome everyone to my talk about generic programming without writing your own templates. I choose the title because it doesn't mean we're not using templates, <clears throat> but we're using them from the standard library. So first I will share the motivation to give this talk, and then I will highlight the SDL features, span, variant, any, and function, which allow for generic programming. After each chapter, there will be a pause and a chance for you to ask questions. Um, I will also ask, answer any questions at the end, but I think we have enough time. Um, also, if you don't get your question in um, during the, the breaks in the middle, then you can ask in the end. And also, I will stay around um, in Remo and Discord, so you can always reach me. So, let's start. I know I said I want to tell you ways to do generic programming without writing templates, but in order to explain why, I will have to start with templates. So templates, as you probably know, are used to enable generic programming. I got a function template here, which accepts any type and prints its value to the console using cout. Then I call the function with an int and a double, and it prints out the values. Um, now I define my own type, which is a date, and I create a date and call the print function with it. And now I will get a compile error. And in MSVC, it looks like this. I get this wall of text here, which doesn't even fit on the slide, but on the very top, it says that the streaming operator is not overloaded for my date type, which is true. And that brings me to the, my first point that if you're not used to template errors um, like this, they can be very over overwhelming and hard to read. C20 promises better error messages with the usage of concepts. So I wrote a streamable concept here, which requires that the streaming operator is overloaded or the passed in type for the function. If not, the function will not be part of the overload set of the passed in type. If we call print on our date now, we will get this compile error in MSVC, which is currently not very helpful since it only says that the associated constraints are not satisfied, which is of course true, but it doesn't tell me which constraints are not satisfied and why. I have no doubt at all that this will improve in the future. And other compilers like GCC already have slightly better uh, compiler errors, but I still say there's room for improvement. And why you will probably get used to compiler errors over the time there are still other problems that come with templated code. It can also increase compile times and exposes the details of the implementation to the interface. So now we take a look at other ways of generic programming. And I will start with a span. So a span is a non-owning view over a contigu contiguous sequence of objects. And I will give you a little bit more information now. So let's look at this example. We calculate the mean of elements of a vector of doubles. Now I need the exact same function, but not for a vector, but for an array. The easiest way to do this is, of course, copy the function and change vector to array. But we're not doing that. Please don't copy your code. Um, this is against the core guidelines, and also it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's not a good habit. But uh, what else can you do? you could create a function template for this. But this has some disadvantages, like the function now has to be in the header, which exposes the implementation to the interface, and it can also lead to longer compile times. And also, in this case here, t is unconstrained. It can be anything. And um, you can get very funny compile errors um, for functions like that. Um, but what you want, what you really want, is just a range of doubles. We can check for that. We can check if t is a range of doubles, and we can even do so in, uh, by, at compile time by using enable if or concepts. And, but, but I think it's all kind of over-engineered for a simple mean of double values. What we want is a range of doubles, just any range of doubles. And that's where span comes in. Span allows us to write this. 
This is the same function, but it takes a span of const doubles as an argument. So a span is a wrapper for contiguous data. It holds a pointer to the data and a size, so it's a non-owning container. The data is stored elsewhere. Span provides a container interface, including iterators, size and boundary checks, even for data that traditionally doesn't have them, like C-style arrays. That makes working with these data structures safer, and you can even use them in this function here. Now you can call the function with a vector, an array, or a C-style array, or any other contiguous range. In these examples, the corresponding constructor of span gets called. If you're using a non-standard container, you can use the pointer to the data and the size of the range to construct the span. That means the function <clears throat> that means you can call the function with anything the constructors of span accept. And this has some advantages. This is easy to write, easy to read, easy to use. Um, you won't have to write any templates. You don't need any compile time checks for the type that you're passing in, and um, you can call it with any type of contiguous memory. So now that I showed you some examples of uh, how to use span in the context of using the entire range, I will now show you an example of what you can do if you want to leave out, for example, the first two and the last two elements of the range and still call the same function. You can write something like this. We get the address of the third element in the vector as a start point for a span. And to exclude the last two elements, we would have to use the vector size minus two. Or we calculate the length of the resulting span. But if you're like me, uh, you maybe don't want to fiddle around with pointers and addresses. And I also think it doesn't look very pretty. You could also use uh, iterators for this. They look a little bit nicer. And here you have the same pattern of adding two at the beginning and at the end of uh, the, the iterators. And this works as well. And I think it's at least a little bit prettier than before. And C20 already uh, also provides us with ranges. With ranges, you can write drop two to drop the first two elements or skip the first two elements and drop last two to uh, skip the last two elements. I think this is very expressive and reads nicely. I'm using the range v3 library here since the standard ranges provide a drop method, but not a drop last method. But range v3 does, and I'm sure the standard library will do in the future as well. The span itself also plays nicely with ranges. For example, we can take every other element of the span using stride. Again, stride here is not part of the standard ranges, but is part of the range with three library. When I first started looking at span, I really didn't like it. I, I, seen, I, I, th I thought the construction is odd with all the pointers, but after playing around a little with them, I really started to like them. And if you see a compiler explorer symbol, uh, symbol like in this slide here, that means that I prepared an example in Compiler Explorer and the link will take you there. So you can play around with the examples yourselves. If you don't see the symbol right now, probably my camera is blocking it, but it is there, I, I swear. So while it can be very useful in some use, so while span can be very useful in some use cases, um, you should be aware that there are some pitfalls that might not be obvious at first. Um, we have this piece of code here. We create a vector, then making a span and attempt to change the first argument of the vector through the span. And this code um, compiles and works because um, the span, um, the, the vector is not const, and I can change the um, the elements of the vector through the span. Now we make the vector const. This doesn't compile because you cannot change the values of a const vector. And the same thing happens here, where we make the span const. The vector is still const, and we cannot change the values. But now, if we only, only remove the const from the vector, but not from the span, this compiles and runs because the span itself is const, but uh, not its elements. 
And since the vector is not const, you can change it here, even if the span is not const. This might be surprising and not what you want or intend, but we can fix this. In this particular case, where you have a non-const vector and want a const span, that is, you don't want to change the original vector, you will have to say so in the type. If you don't, CTED in this case here will create a span of doubles, which allows the underlying vector to be modified if it isn't const. Making only the span const means that the span cannot point to different data. It is a similar problematic with const pointers. Depending on where you place the const, you either make the pointer const, meaning that you cannot change where the pointer points to, or you cannot change the data behind the pointer, or both. And there are not a lot of traps when it comes to using span, but this is one thing that you should be aware of. Usually a span would be used in a context like described before, where you write a function and want it to be generic without making it a template. In this context, you should expect a span of const values so that you cannot change the underlying range by accident. And like you have to be aware of the constness of the span, <coughs> you will also have to be aware of its lifetime. <coughs> Sorry. Um, when you know string view, you probably know the discussions around string view and how it can be seen as unsafe and lead to dangling references. And the same basically applies to span. Span is a view of contiguous data, just like a view, uh, a, just like string view is a view of a string. That means it can be seen as a reference and there are things to look out for. So let's look at this example. What could be the problem? Um, in, in the function, we return a reference to a local variable. And um, when the function is over, the local vari variable gets destroyed and um, the function will return a dangling reference. And the same applies to span. So here in this example, I have a vector. I create a span from the vector, and then I return the span. And um, so uh, when I call this function, the span is already destroyed um, by uh, because it goes out of scope, and then the span uh, contains a dangling reference. But that doesn't mean you can never return a span from a function. For example, when writing a wrapper for span that can handle non-standard containers, like in this case, boost multi-array, you want to return a span. In this case shown here, returning a span is fine since the lifetime of the thing span is referring to is controlled outside of the function. Um, in conclusion, don't return a span unless it's uh, referencing something that exists after the function is over. And the last thing, um, span doesn't provide lifetime extension like you're used to. I will go through this example to explain um, the lifetime extension issue. So here I have a function that returns a vector. And in the calling code here, I create a vector from this function. And so this line is totally fine because we create the vector in place here. And um, so the, the data of the vector um, will be there uh, as long as vec1 is in scope. The next line looks problematic. <coughs> Sorry. Um, it creates a reference to a temporary. And normally you would expect problems with this code because, um, uh, because it's a reference to a temporary. But since we make it a const reference, the uh, lifetime extension kicks in and keeps the vector alive uh, as long as vector is in scope. But for the last line, sorry, for the last line, we create a span from a temporary vector. And this vector will not be kept alive as long as the span is alive. When we hit the next line, the vector is gone and the span contains a, de contains a dangling reference. So basically, if you think of span as a reference, then you know what to look out for. I would say the most common usage of span is when making a function more generic. And in this case, you shouldn't run into the described problems. So now that I probably totally sold you on span, but you may not, you may not be able to use C++20 yet, what can you do? 
In this case, you can have a look at the guideline support library, short GSL. It provides features to help writing code according to the C++ core guidelines. And one of those features is a span implementation. It provides, uh, it provides the same functionality um, with a very similar interface. And it requires C++ 14. So here is our mean example that we saw at the beginning. And let's change it now from the span, standard span to GSL span. Did you see it? The difference is very subtle. It is right here. Um, so our example actually looks exactly the same. You will have to change the includes and the namespaces, but otherwise it's the same. So that's enough about spam. So if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer them now before we move on to the next session. So the first question I get, um, are third-party containers, which are more like 1D boost multi-array uh, <clears throat> or others, extends or eigenblaze compatible with spam? Yes, there should be. Um, so, as long as they have contiguous memory, which I know Boost Multi-Array has, and I'm sure um, Extensor and Eigen has as well, Blaze, I don't know, um, then they are compatible. And you may want to write a own um, wrapper um, for Span in order to use them with these data structures, but I don't see why they, they shouldn't work as long as they have contiguous memory. So. And the next question is, how does standard span compare to ranges in view? I don't know, actually. I haven't looked into um, any view. I, I would have to look it up. Sorry. And um, the next question is, is there a downside to replacing all conspectorf arguments with span? Um, if I don't know if there's a downside, but I think it's not necessary. So if you only expect vectors in your function, then um, you you should be, in, in my opinion, you should be as less generic as possible, so as less generic as you need. So um, you can change it to span. And I don't think it has any performance um, uh, implications, but um, why would you do that if, if you don't need it? So if you only call the function with uh, with a vector, then I personally wouldn't change that. Um, the follow-up question here is, um, won't span create a copy of your vector? No, it wouldn't. A span is a non-owning view of a container. It stores a pointer to the data and a size. That's all there is to it. And then it has like this um, member functions um, or this, um, there's functions that provide the the iterator stuff like begin and end and boundary checks and so on, um, but they come from the standard library and it's not um, required to copy the data for that. So that's why it's important to notice that the span is a non-owning um, container of data. So if you destroy the data that the span is referring to, then uh, you will have a problem because the like. Maybe it refers to a vector, and if you destroy the vector, then it isn't there anymore. And then the span is useless, basically, because it contains a pointer to data that doesn't exist anymore. So these are the questions I had, uh, I got so far. If you have any more questions, I will wait a second. But, but also, we will have a Q&A in the end as well. So if you don't get your um, question answered right now, I will answer it at the end as well. And also, I am loosely monitoring the chat. So um, if you want to ask a question, please do it in the Q&A panel. Um, because I won't be able to keep up with the discussions in the chat. And here it says that you shouldn't rely on lifetime extension in C++. And um, I think that's right. Uh, you shouldn't. Um, I just showed the example that in this case, you get lifetime extension 
but in the in, in the same coach um, in the case of the span you don't get any so yeah you shouldn't rely on lifetime extension um, try to make the coach um, safe in that regard so since i don't see any more questions i will move on to the next um, chapter which is variant and variant is a C17 feature. What is a variant? Uh, a variant is a type safe union. So if you're like me and you never used a union before, especially not in C, you might ask yourself, um, what is a union? So let me explain that shortly. A union is a user defined type which, in which all members share the same memory location. It means no matter how many members a union has, it always uses only enough memory to store the largest member. In this case here, it would be double. This means that in any given time, a union can, not, can contain no more than one object of its members. A union can be useful for conserving memory if you have uh, lots of objects but limited memory available. However, a union requires extra care to use correctly. You're responsible for ensuring that you always access the same member you assigned. In this example, I first assign a value to the int member and then accessing it is okay because it was the last one I assigned. Next, I assign a value to the double member and then again, accessing it is fine because it was the last one I assigned. But now, if I want to assign the int member again, I will get undefined behavior. Therefore, you will have to know which, was the, <clears throat> which value was the last one that was assigned. Sorry. So you, have to, you would have to know the last value that was assigned in order to safely access it which means typically that you have to write code around it, like encapsulating the union into a struct because the union itself doesn't hold any kind of this information. Also, if any member types have a non-trivial constructor, then you have to write additional code to explicitly construct and destroy the active members. Most sources advise for not using unions um, because of the described problems here, um, but use a variant instead. And that brings us to variant. Variant lets you handle these types safely, and it also constructs and deconstructs the type safely. To explain how it works, I will go through an example. We will make a little excursion into mathematics. So this is the quadratic function, and this is its quadratic formula, to calculate the solution. To determine how many solutions the function has, we look at the expression underneath the square root sign, which is called the discriminant. If it's smaller than zero, the graph doesn't cross the x-axis and there's no solution, at least no real one, and we will stay within real numbers. If the discriminant is zero, then the, graph, uh, the function has one solution and the graph bounces off the x-axis, and if it's bigger than zero, the graph crosses the x-axis in two places, which gives us two solutions. So let's code this. First we, uh, <clears throat> first, we define the output for the function. And the output is a variant. It holds a pair of doubles as its first solution, or the, the solution with the, um, as a, the case with the two solutions, and uh, one double um, as a case uh, as a one solution case and monostate if there's no solution. So monostate is a, uni is a unit type that can be used as an empty alternative invariant. And since variant is non-default constructible, it can list monostate as its first um, alternative, which makes it default constructible. So it can come in handy if you need to construct an instance of a variant, but it cannot hold any of the alternatives yet. So now we write, <clears throat> now we write the function calculating the square roots. 
The return type is the variant. And we will first calculate uh, the discriminant which we will need for all the cases. If it's positive, we return the two solutions as a pair. And in this case, the active type of the variant will be the pair. In case the discriminant is zero, we return the one solution. And then the active type of the variant will be the one double. And if the discriminant is uh, negative, then we return monostate to say that we didn't get any solutions. I like this example here because normally a function can only have one return type. But with variant, we can wrap all the return types into, uh, into one type. So now let's see how we call this function. In the first line, uh, we call the function. Now we probably want to do something with the result. Variant provides us with an option to check which type is active, and that is holds alternative. With this function, you can check which type is active. The call is ill-formed if the variant doesn't contain the requested type exactly once. That means if the variant um, holds the requested type more than once or not at all. If your variant holds multiple instances of the same type, you will need to access the data in another way, but I will come to that. Now that we know um, the active type, we can use get with the active type um, to get the value out of the variant. If you access a non-active type, you get a bad variant access exception. We can proceed with the other alternatives the same way. Instead of using the types to get the data from the variant, you can also use an index. To determine the active index, that is the index of the alternative type in the variance type list, you can use the index function. Then again, you can check um, at runtime if, if you got the active index, and then use get, but it's that now, uh, instead of using the type, you use the index to get the type out of, uh, get the value out of the variant. Again, if you access here a non-active member, then you will get a bad variant access exception. This method here works also if you have multiple alternatives of the same type. If you can't have exceptions in your code, you can also um, you can also get the alternatives as a pointer to the data in the variant. And if this goes wrong, then you will get a null pointer as uh, as a result. So then you can check for that. You also may have heard of um, the function visit in combination with variant. Visit, expe <clears throat> uh, visit expects a so-called visitor function, which is a callable that accepts every possible alternative from every pass in variant. In our case, we will only have one variant. So our visitor only needs to cover all three types of the variant. The visitor here is a struct um, that overloads the function call operator on all three types. So in the first case, we print out the two roots. In the second case, we print out the double root. And in the last case, we print out that we found no roots. You can see that the arguments for the functions match with the types that we defined in the variant. Now, if you call visit on our root printer, the result of the end. Now that we can call, now we can call visit on uh, with the root printer we just um, we just wrote on the result of the calculates root function, and it will call the correct function for the active type and prints out the results. It's also possible to use a generic lambda for this. But in this case, all types of the variant need to fulfill the same interface. The example I wrote here will not compile because the pair cannot be streamed like this. The operator is not overloaded. 
there are ways around this, like overloading the operator yourself. But since you probably want to do something different, given which type is active, a struct like shown before might be a better alternative. But there is also a way to do this with the lambdas or to do the, the visit with the lambdas. And I will have to bother you a little bit with template code here. Um, what I'm going to show is the so-called overload pattern. <clears throat> at its core, uh, at least in C++20, it's this one line of function. Uh, it's this one line of code. Um, the overload struct is uh, derived from all the lambda types it gets. And it uses pack expansion to bring the function call operators from all the lambdas into the scope so that they can be called. This code here requires C20 and it works on the newest version of MSVC and GCC trunk. No version of Clang currently supports this. And if you want to do this with Clang or an older version of the other compilers, you will need the C17 way and get a custom template argument deduction guide, which is this line of code. Um, so I'm not going into more detail here for the overload pattern. There's an excellent blog post that I also link in the resources slide um, in this slide deck here, so you can read up on this. So now that we have the, uh, the overload struct defined, we can write something like this. We can call a visit on an instance of the overload struct. And we initialize the overload struct with all the lambdas that cover all cases um, of, the, of the variant. Now the visitor functions are defined in place and you don't have to write a struct for this. This can be useful if you only need the visitor once. So by using variant, you can have your code fairly flexible reacting to different types, which makes it generic. Other use cases for variant include state machines, uh, passing of command lines or config files, and surely many, many more. And before I move on to the next section, are there any questions to variant? So um, the first question is, do you see a use case for heterogeneous um, containers like, uh, like vector of variant of um, in double string? Um, I'm not sure. I, I never used um, a lot of variant myself. Um, I just don't have a lot of use cases personally for that. But I think, why not, if you have um, yeah, if, if you need to store in a vector um, multiple uh, results, for example, for this calculates root function, um, then yeah, why not? I, I don't see um, that there should be any problems with that. But you can also get the type and then store it in some other um, like a container-like uh, thing if you need to store it. Are there any plans to put overload into the standard? Uh, I read um, that there's something planned, but it's all, it was also in the blog post, but I, I don't follow standard, um, standard papers and discussions in the standard, so I, I don't really know. But in C20, um, again, you only have to write this, um, this one line of code which defines the, uh, the overload struct. And um, you can have this in like a central point of your of your code, and call it from there anywhere. So it, it, it's getting a little bit simpler. I don't know if it will go into the standard, but um, it already gotten a little bit simpler. Will the compiler check that a visitor covers all cases of the variant type? Um, 
I haven't tried, actually. Um, if you stick around until the end, we can try that out. I have the solution here that I used. Um, I'm sure we can try this out. So now I don't see any more open questions. Again, if you um, if you have any open questions, then you can also post them in the end. So we will move on to the next um, structure, and this is any. And any is again something that makes something safer that already existed in the language in some way, and that is the void pointer. And again, I will explain first what a void pointer is before I move on to any. If you know I a dynamically type language like Python, you know you can do something like this. Normally, it's not possible in C++. If you want to change uh, <clears throat> the value of a variable, you can only assign values of the same type or a type that is implicit convertible to that type, or you explicitly convert the type but you cannot change the type itself. If you need a way to achieve this, then you could use a void pointer. The void pointer itself has no type. It can hold the address of any other object. That means a pointer to an object that of any type that can be converted to a void pointer. But a void pointer cannot be dereferenced. To obtain its value, it, it needs to be casted to the type it holds. And there lies a problem. The, the void pointer has no information about its type. The cast only works correctly if you know the type you want to cast to. And if you cast to the wrong type, you could invoke undefined behavior. Um, at best, the, progr pro the, problem, the program is not behaving the way you want it to be, and at worst, it crashes and leaves security problems. Also, the void pointer doesn't manage lifetime, so it has to be done manually. Um, which can lead to uh, memory leaks. So here in this example, so here's an example of how you would use a void pointer. First, we define uh, first I define three variables: a string, a double, and an int. Next, I define a void pointer, and it first um, it, uh, it will be initialized with the address of the string, and then I change um, the object the void pointer points to by I'm assigning a new address. To get the value back, I cast the void pointer to the concrete type and dereference it. Um, this works fine if I cast to the last assigned type, like here, but it can invoke undefined behavior if I cast to the wrong type. It can be very unsafe to use a void pointer and therefore is discouraged from using in C++ where we have other forms of static and dynamic polymorphism. But there are use cases for void pointers. And uh, with C++17, they can be implemented in using any. So here's the same example we saw in the slide before, but using any. And what I like about this is that we have value semantics and not pointer semantics. You can also directly assign a new value. And in this case, um, any will destroy the active object it holds. And that includes calling the destructor if necessary. That itself makes the type way safer than a void pointer because you don't have to manage lifetime yourself. By default, any contains no value, and we can check for that. It will, uh, the function has value return true if any holds a value and false if not. And also any knows the type it holds, and it can be obtained by calling type on it, which returns the type ID of the contained type. So you can check the type at runtime. Um, to get the type of the any, you will have to cast it in, into the contained type by using any cast. It will throw an exception when you cast, um, when, when the cast is not correct. Um, <clears throat> Any cast can return a copy to the contained value or a reference which is writable. And if you um, want, if 
if you wanted to return a pointer, you won't get an exception if the cast fails, but again, you will get a null pointer. And this is interesting for people who cannot use exceptions in their code. And any can also be reset to an empty state. And you can also in place construct a new value, which is interesting for bigger types or types that are non-movable or non-copyable. Um, in this case, instead of creating a new type and copy or move it into any, it will be constructed in place. It works like the emplace function that you may know from vector or tuple or pair. So what are the use cases for any? Um, this is the example from the original paper that introduced any into C++. It is a property class which can hold any type. It can be useful in a generic UI or a game editor. Other use cases include um, libraries where a, a library can hold um, or, or has to hold or pass any type without knowing the available types. Um, passing files if you cannot specify the supported types, message passing, um, binding with a scripting language or implementing an interpreter for a scripting language, and also a user interface where the controls might hold anything. But all in all, all sources I read said about the same, only use any if you don't have any other options. If you have knowledge of the supported types, a variant might be a better choice. Also, the type can only be known at runtime, which can lead to performance problems if it's necessary to check that all the time. Also, if you assign a new value um, to any, it will perform extra dynamic memory allocations. And this is also a thing that you have to be aware of. So if you want to use any, but can't or won't use C++ 17, you can consider using Boost Any, which is C++ 98 compatible. Its implementation is basically the same as the standard implementation, but there are some differences. The biggest difference might be the small buffer optimization. That means for small types like int, no memory will be allocated for the standard any. So the any type has to be big enough to hold the small types. And from what I read, Boost Any has a size of eight bytes, and the standard any can have a size up to um, 64 bytes. So that is something that you might consider if you need to uh, make the memory consumption of the any type as small as possible. Also, as a consequence, boost any will allocate memory even for small types like int. Um, <clears throat> the other two um, differences are that you cannot in place construct types for the boost any, but for the standard any, you can. Um, Jonathan Boraka's Fluent C++ blog has two very interesting articles on any, and I link them also in the resources slide at the end of the slide deck, and if you're interested, you can check them out. And that brings us again to questions. So, um, the first question is, suppose we create a variant of int and string, and we change the size of string, grow its size, more than its buffer, what will happen? Um, there's an answer already, it should work. The main difference between union and variant <clears throat> is that uh, variant ability to handle um, classes, structs that are not allowed in unions. And that is true, um, the, the memory will be, um, so in this case, the uh, like you would um, handle the memory of a string that is not in a variant, the variant would destroy the old string and um, create a new string. And you won't have to do anything um, to do this yourself. Um, so this is a, a big plus of, of variant. So you don't have to um, do any of this manually. So the next question is, does standard any work by allocating on heap and holding a void pointer? So, um, so is it standard or just more a common implementation? And I already answered that. That's, that's good. <laughs> uh, 
Um, does any require extra memory allocations on the heap? Yes, it does. Um, as I said, also for the small buffer optimization, the boost any um, allocates everything on the heap, even small types, but um, the standard any has the small buffer optimization, but everything else will be allocated on the heap. Um, how is memory allocated um, for any? Again, uh, I guess I answered that. And um, can you cast any to out or without knowing the type? Uh, I don't think so. But I also never tried. So might be interesting to try. But I don't think so. Okay, so that brings us to the last section, which is function. And um, function can also be used to make code a little bit less generic when you don't need to, to be extremely generic. And uh, while function is not exactly new since it was introduced into C++11, it fits the theme. So let's consider the following scenario. We have a higher order function that is a function that accepts a callable. And there are lots of applications for this. For example, the standard algorithms um, like um, transform and each are all higher order functions. They all accept a callable, which will manipulate the data. And in those, those cases, the code has to be as generic as possible. But when you write your own code, you don't have to be quite as flexible usually. So let's look at this example here. We have a function that filters the elements of a vector with the use of a generic function, which is called condition. And I used a template for this here. If the condition returns true, the function does something with the elements. Now, if we call this um, with a lambda, um, the function prints out the elements that satisfy the condition, which in our case are all elements that are bigger than two. Um, in the next line, I most likely made an error and returned um, the value itself instead of a bool. Um, this is probably not what we want, and it's not warned against. And now the function prints all elements as long as the value is not exactly zero. And this looks like a potential bug. Also, the usage of a template here, again, um, exposes the implementation to the interface. But we can rewrite this by using a standard function. Um, with function, we specify the return type and the type of the arguments, which makes it, I think, I think it makes it more readable. And um, because you can see what kind of callable is expected. But even with warning level four in MSVC, um, the last line here, which returns only the double and not a bool, is not warned against. But when I turn on the warning um, for um, implicit conversion from double to bool, then, um, or implicit conversions to bool, um, then the last line will be warned against. So this is a very basic example, but I'm sure the compiler um, warnings or the compiler errors can be a little bit more helpful when using function because um, it checks that um, the um, it, it checks that the callable you're passing in also fits the interface. Um, standard function might also come with a performance overhead that you should be aware of. So the function wraps a callable type, but it is not parametricized on its callable type itself, but on its return and argument types. So the function doesn't know how much data was captured in the callable type. But in order to make the function copyable and movable, the data has to be copied, which uh, happens at runtime and leads to memory allocations. If function wouldn't do that, it would risk um, calling reference. It would risk dangling references when calling the callable, but the data it originally captured isn't there anymore. 
But in this example here, ownership of the data doesn't have to be transferred. And also the Lambda doesn't even um, capture any data. So the template that we used at the very beginning might be the most efficient when it comes to memory allocation, since it doesn't allocate any um, new memory at all. Um, but you can also use um, function ref for this. And Cybrand has an implementation of function ref, which you can uh, use uh, like the same way you would use a function. And a function ref is a non-owning wrapper for a callable. But you have to be aware that you can only use it in cases where the function wrapper doesn't need to own the captured values. So you have to be sure that um, if the function captures any values, that they are there at the time that the function or the function ref here is called. And this example I have here is a perfect use case for function ref. So there are many ways to achieve generic programming with the usage of the standard library. We can use C++ 20 span to pass along any contiguous range, C++ 17's variant if you don't know the set of the supported types, and also C++ 17's any if you have um, no knowledge about the types. And uh, as a not so new feature, you can use C++ 17's function in higher order functions. C++ is a very flexible language, and there are many ways to achieve what you want to achieve. In general, you will have to take memory consumption and performance into account. The features I presented here um, are, not, uh, are, are not the only way or not the right way to solving the problems, but they are a possible way. And now we enter the final round of questions. Um, assuming we can use C20's concepts to constrain a callable and pass into a function, um, is there any case left for function <clears throat> or is function ref preferable? Um, so you can use C20's concept um, to um, constrain the callable, but then again, it is still a template. So if you want to avoid the, the template stuff, then you have a use case for function. And the function ref is only um, an option if, uh, if you know for sure that the data that is used in the function is there, is still there when the function is called. Um, yeah, so there are, I, I think there are all different use cases. So there is no function is better than function ref, but you have to, um, uh, you have to make uh, sure that, that, that you know basically what you're doing when, when you use higher order functions. I hope that answers the question. So I'm scrolling a little bit through the chat. But if you have a question, please uh, um, write them in the, in the Q&A panel. Um, do you think higher order functions should be um, normal types, like in any other languages like Haskell? Um, to be honest, I never looked into Haskell, so uh, I'm not the right person to answer the question. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I I don't know. I also not sure what you mean with the normal types. So if you want to chat with me about that, I will um, hang out in Remo, and I will also be available in Discord. And um, you can see on the slide here my Twitter handle. You can also reach me at Twitter if you want to. <clears throat> 